I love the 80s. Akadaka. All right, if you're outside and you haven't made your mind up, just go and grab someone. Do you know? Physical violence. That'll work for us. All right. I say we, I say we kick this bad boy off. Um, welcome to, uh, to the conference. I, I hope you've enjoyed the warm-up uh, for the last day and a half. It's been good. Uh, <laughs> if you could fill me in, <laughs> I missed it writing slides. Um, I, uh, just to the, the lady doing the, the hand things, um, if you could do them in Australian. <laughs> I'm not sure if more kangaroo gestures or something, I don't um, So, uh, I, I just want to introduce me, introduce this topic and, uh, and, and the t-shirt that I'm wearing. So, uh, over five years ago, I, I put a blog post up because there was a, there was this thing, it was silly, it was called Twitter and, uh, and they, one of them complained a lot about Ruby and Rails and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and so uh, I wrote a blog post and I released a little bit of code which basically said, look, I don't want to make a big deal of it, but I've solved all of your scaling problems. Um, <laughs> it was silly. You'd never use it. But as you see at the bottom, I said, oh, I wonder if they'll give me a free Twitter account. I didn't, have, I didn't know what it was for. And, uh, or at least a T-shirt. Um, <laughs> And actually, so at the next rail, Rubikoff later in the year, Alex Payne actually gave me this t-shirt. Um, and I uh, completely forgot about it, except there is a Twitter bot that on your five year anniversary apparently tells you, congratulations, you've had a Twitter account for five years, how's it going for you? Um, so I, that, you know, I thought I should get this. Do you know if you go to Twitter now, you cannot get this t-shirt? I mean, it's mine, so fuck off. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, more about me, my background. Um, it turns out that I have been thinking about distributed systems for a while, whilst at the same time not caring at all about them. Very confusing state of mind to be in. Um, but uh, my, <laughs> I actually remembered my topic was something along the lines of how do you change distributed applications at runtime um, in a sort of enterprise scenario where there's lots of different participants and, and it's awkward and, and how do you let that application do it all itself. And I highly recommend not reading uh, that 200 pages of quality text uh, mostly because it was written when my, one of my PhD uh, supervisors gave me this top tip on how do you write a PhD thesis. And she said, the more boring, the better. You can imagine why they're not selling uh, with O'Reilly or pragmatic programmers. Um, so, but making it red was about my only sort of daringness uh, at the end. So that was a long time ago. Um, I, for a couple of years, did Rails consulting, but I did the app bit. I made the thing. I didn't make it pretty, and I didn't make it run. I just made it. Someone else did the other bits of, of doing ops. Um, but then, I don't know, I became more interested in this space of, of production apps. And uh, so I came to this country, uh, whichever one it is, and uh, well, I mean, in four days' time, it could be different, so who knows? Um, remember to vote. Whatever. Um, doesn't matter what you do, you're going to keep killing foreigners with drones. So, you know. I'd like to say it was safer to be here, away from the drones, but then everyone's got a gun. Um, actually, I don't know if you noticed, if you go to the front doors, not now, um, right at the bottom is the little sign, little like no smoking sign that has uh, no guns and no knives. Um, I'm not sure how short people are that have guns that would notice that. But. So, when I, uh, so Engineer, if you don't know, we, uh, one of the, you know, we do the, the hosting of the Ruby apps that you may be having one or two of. Um, specifically, mostly around businesses, people that have actual you know, big apps that are doing big things. So um, it's really fun and interesting to hang out with those people. And I've learned more than, I mean, honestly, I've learned stuff. And everything I learned, I didn't want to learn. I didn't come to engineering I had to learn DevOps and system administration and cloud stuff. That's, I just like writing apps. So in the last two years, I've accidentally learned things. And unfortunately, due to your choice of session, you're going to now learn some of those things. And uh, so I, I will attempt to at least make it interesting. So when I, uh, how I came to be thinking about this particular topic, which we'll get into, was that last year, I tried to convince a large number of people that you should use JRuby and Rubinius. Um, and I tried to focus specifically on one aspect, which was threading. Because last year there was a lot of hoo-ha about how much fun it would be to do JavaScript and invented programming. Um, 
Fortunately, we've all got over that. It was all a bit silly. Um, and now we've gotten back to writing apps that are both neither uh, evented nor concurrent. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but I tried to make it really simple. I said, you know, you still do want invented programming, and you still want threads. And uh, fortunately, web apps, really easy. Put the, the procedural stuff, wrap it up in an implicit thread around the request, and then put invented at the front, uh, and use Nginx, and uh, that was it. You know what? I thought it was a really compelling argument. No one changed their behavior based on that. Um, and so I started to think about this idea that, uh, that, that choosing JRuby, choosing Rubinius was perhaps more of a, an operations choice. You were going to choose it for perhaps business reasons, like using less resources um, and uh, uh, perhaps getting better debugging out of a production system and things like that. And perhaps developers didn't make those choices or didn't want to. Or they knew they wanted to but just didn't for some mystical reason. And that became really interesting to me, which is now kind of where this, this talk starts off. Um, so uh, I guess, unfortunately, I, there is another slide about me. I've done lots of stuff. There is a website that actually tells you approximately how many projects you've, uh, well, I don't know, if you're a dog urinated on, um, how many, you've participated, sorry, that's the word. Um, and uh, I've, a lot, and, uh, but what I've become interested in is the idea of, of resilient production systems, but also ones that I could just ignore. Because I've gotten really good at ignoring static systems, I have a GitHub repo full of them, easy to ignore. You just turn off the notifications, easy as you like. Um, but production systems don't seem to be as ignorable. Um, and so here's my uh, sort of fun challenge for you, to spot the difference between 300 code bases and 300 apps. All right, now, uh, I don't know if you've spotted, so this is my metaphor, There's, um, sort of 300 books on a shelf versus 300 people in a company. The books are a lot more fun. All right, people suck. And uh, I mean, look around. You're all ugly and uh, no. <laughs> That's not true, you're not all ugly. And, um, but you know, so static things are a lot easier to, to, to live with and think about. And, uh, um, and so it's kind of in the nature of our profession as engineers. We're a Ruby conference, we're not a DevOps conference. We like to write code. And uh, we like to write code, we like to test code. And it's just a really sad, unfortunate sub-part of our profession that for most of us, it unfortunately goes into production. And if we don't talk about it, <laughs> that's just, just, you know, it's just annoying. <laughs> yes, it's running, and yes, there's a dot .com, and look at my code and how pretty it is. That's the important part. And uh, look how fast my tests are. Look at the, you know, we don't talk about the production stuff very much. I mean, it's a sad indictment on Ruby that no, sad. Yeah, sad. I mean, Engine Yard, Heroku, and those sorts of companies came out into existence, created concepts like PaaS. No one else needed to solve these problems, but we did. That's how bad it was to try and run Ruby apps. So I mean, this is this, this idea that, that as a group, we have so optimized around our own developer happiness that I'd like you to start thinking that as your production code bases get bigger, dug in more traffic, you are going to need to give up some of that. You're going to need to start to think more about production happiness. Because if you don't, you won't be a happy developer. Actually, I can't prove that. It's just it's true. That's the quality uh, argument you're going to get here <laughs> in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> Trust me. All right, it sucks. So oh, you need to do both. All right, so let's go through this. Uh, just in case you've never had a production app, <laughs> that's what one looks like. Um, traffic comes from the left. Uh, <laughs> don't know which way you're looking. Um, and, uh, but it's not, not just easy, constant traffic. Sometimes it comes in impulses. Sometimes it comes um, in sort of large, stressful batches. And uh, keeping your app running in those situations is uh, not something you've probably ever done before. It would be quite torturous to live with. Uh, other things you're going to do with production systems is uh, change them, deploy things, which you may have seen in the title of the talk. And uh, I will come back to, uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time just talking about uh, tools in general, round thinking around this space, and then specifically focus on the title of the talk, which is what I think is the frontier of the next sort of thing we need to be thinking about in deployment. Um, because obviously there's a lot of arrows involved, and we need to be careful of them. Um, 
And uh, then we do, that's called the magic move feature of uh, Keynote. It's very cool, I'm gonna do it again. Nope. Oh, look at that. Um, so uh, uh, inside your app, it's a bunch of bits. I know, see this is tricky, because you all think your app, your Ruby app, is like God's gift to, you know, if only you could just put that on the home page, people would buy more stuff. Sadly, <laughs> it's just another box surrounded by other boxes which do stuff. And your app talks to those boxes. And if all things go well, perhaps your users do stuff. Um, but all the boxes need to keep working. They need to talk to each other. Um, and uh, if you start to scale, and if you watch some of these other talks, people saying, you know, one web app box is not enough. We need lots more web app boxes. Then uh, it'll look like this. And you can only imagine this is getting simpler. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is popular at the moment, the service oriented architecture, because Steve Yeggy told us to, because he worked at Amazon. <laughs> That's kind of his logic. Um, anyway, no, 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 I don't want to diss the SOA, I just want to say that when you do this, something's going to happen. Uh, not only yet, you, the code you wrote and the things you control talk to other things that you have less control of. Um, I guess my best example is um, if you watch the Travis, and no disrespect to Travis, but I, this, I've noticed this, they and, and uh, Engine Yard's own blog, uh, Twitter account, so Travis's Twitter account, our account, Twitter account, often has to make comment about how our customers can't do something because, uh, for example, GitHub might be down, or Ruby Gems might be down. So this is this idea that the external dependencies are part of our production system even if we don't control them. And, uh, um, but nonetheless, so even if you've never sort of had that picture in your head, let me just give you the picture that's actually in your head. The dashboard of your brain. The dashboard of your brain pretty much says, ah, shit, something's wrong. Or what it's thinking is, they're just the normal errors. <laughs> Move on. No one needs to build that dashboard. All right, <laughs> locked in. Um, but I just want to sort of say, do some basic math. Basic math. Um, I'm going to use the water if anyone else would like some. It's just up here. Not enough cups to go around, but I think on the whole, most of you are probably not going to come up. <laughs> Even though you were invited. All right, hopefully you've gone through the sums. I'm not sure if you call them sums, but that's what they are. The arithmetic. Um, that if, uh, if you've got um, a sequence of, of parts, could be an app to a database, an app to a caching to a database, whatever, an app to another app to a database, um, if there's some sort of success rate, which there is, if you're lucky, it's 100%. But if you've got 100% success rate, that's probably because you've had one request. <laughs> and it was successful and you're feeling very confident about yourself. Um, but uh, assuming there's some you know, number, then if they're dependent on each other, then as you go through, and I've used the same number, 95, 95, 95, uh, the basic math is you multiply it out and you get a smaller number. That's the problem. So when you go back and look at that SOA diagram, uh, as you add bits and things talking to each other, the math means that it's more likely something's gonna be wrong at any point in time. Uh, both because of the traffic that's coming in Normal traffic, impulse traffic, stress traffic, uh, or when you change something. So when you're doing deployment, you're changing something, and there's a chance something will go wrong, and the question is, what else is gonna be affected? What bad experience is your customer gonna have? And uh, so yeah, so this diagram is uh, not taken from any real production system, just kind of looked pretty. Uh, couldn't figure out the math for that one. Um, so this is, kind of, this is kind of the high level, idea I'd like you to, sh to think about and take away is, is the things I'm talking about may not be relevant to you yet because you may not have a lot of traffic for your app. Because if, if say you've got a 95% or 85% uh, success rate, which is pretty low, so you, know, you should fix that now, um, and you're only getting 100 requests a day, then you're only gonna have, you got five errors, 15 errors, and that might be okay. As it gets to 1,000 requests, 10,000 requests, whatever the next one is in the sequence, um, you're gonna be less than impressed with what happens. 
Um, we often talk about technical debt. But when all you're doing is doing support because you've just got errors coming at you, make something up. <laughs> um, then, you know, you're, that's, I, I, I start to think of this as sort of operational debt. Your system is causing you so much headache and pain that regardless of how pretty your Ruby code is, especially when it's got syntax highlighting, um, your life is going to be not very fun. And so as you get more traffic, the requirement for you is that you have to constantly be improving the success rate and definitely not making it worse, um, which may or may not be what we think about. And that's kind of you know, this high-level idea. So uh, the unfortunate part is point two, which I tried to hide in the middle and then pointed it out. Let's go back. I'm going to hide it more better this. All right. All right, you can't see it now. Uh, oh, no, it doesn't work. Um, so uh, in order to get to this, we are going to have to think, as, as your company becomes more successful, as your product, your thing gets more, probably, and success is probably traffic, um, you're going to have to think more and more about how to make that system happy, which mathematically, well, let's call it you know, reducing our error rate or increasing our success rate. Um, and my hypothesis is that's going to make you less happy. So let's just get over that and let's get on with the rest of the talk. <laughs> But moving on to point three, uh, I'm, really, I'm really hoping is that the people who are primarily interested in production happiness, which as a group aren't here, it's their responsibility, our responsibility, to give you tools that help you do the right thing by the production system. And that's, that's this from next frontier of deployment. How fast you can ship an app into production, <laughs> it's not very interesting if all you're doing is, is keeping the error rates the same. If the traffic keeps going up, you have to be thinking about how do I uh, uh, keep reducing that traffic, and, and uh, we may have to slow things down a little bit. So I just want to break this out, and just, uh, just in case you've never wondered why you've got a job, uh, how it is that someone else can afford to give you money to do your profession, I just thought I'd go through it for a bit. Um, so, uh, um, so just, uh, there's, there's arrows. Let's go through the arrows first. That's terrible animation. Actually, I feel like fixing it now. Um, so the arrows. So we make code, just in case you haven't seen this before. You make code, you put it into production, and if you're lucky, you get to be in business. Right? Never, never, you know, that's, you know, I don't want to over-summarize it. But, uh, um, and uh, unfortunately, though, the priority of your users, stakeholders, and all that sort of stuff is that you are in business, doing a service or a product that's useful and valuable to people. They are able to find it. They are able to determine this is the thing they want to use at the time that they're having the problem. That's, that's important. Otherwise, your pretty syntax highlighted Ruby code is irrelevant. Um, so in order to do that, and this is the magical step number two, you need to have a production system. Whether you wrote the code or not isn't important. That your production system can provide the value that, to the people that want the value at the time and place that they think they want the value, that's important. Now, for most of us, we wrote the code. Yet it's third on the list of important things. So, awkward, uh, nonetheless. <laughs> uh, so if we do number one too well, we get to have jobs to get to do number three. Um, so uh, you might think, well, we should all care about all things. Well, the fella, Mr. Smith, um, uh, he had this idea that, you know, amongst other very good ideas, you know, three, four, five, was it 500 years ago, four, five, this is an old book, 300 years ago, uh, of division of labor, that if we specialize, we can be better at our thing. And it turns out, if our profession wasn't hard enough, um, probably best, we do specialize in being developers, not doing development and maintaining production systems and trying to make money. So I'm not trying to, I, I would like you all to care about production whilst writing code. This slide is me admitting that it's tough. All right, so what I would rather solve the problem is by, um, and I, I'm over-summarizing, what I'd rather try and solve the problem is by pushing tools towards developers and educating you on choices that will make the production lives better at perhaps a small cost to your developer life. Um, so, okay, this is how most businesses might split themselves out back into those three categories, salespeople, ops people, and engineers. Um, but here, and this is kind of the, I guess I already had this slide in my head, so I should share it first. Um, we all have different fundamental priorities. We are paid and we get joy out of adding features. 
curating the app, making it look nice, doing all those sorts of things. And certainly, uh, most of our stakeholders think that's what we should be doing. Um, but implicit, and priority number two, is that we have a system that has, is up. Certainly from our user's perspective. Right? That's, that's kind of what they expect. At the time they want to use it, it should be there. Um, and the business priority is to make users happy, which hopefully makes money. Um, so, hands up if you think one of these columns is correct. All right, actually, let's start again. Read the chart. <laughs> then we'll play the game. That didn't go very well, did it? When I tested this in my head, everyone was a lot more responsive. All right, um, these, these two lists are kind of what everyone thinks about, or, you know, it cares about, and, you know, summarized down. I mean, when I wrote it down, it was a lot longer, but I figured a few points in bigger font better than my handwritten scrawl. Um, and unfortunately, they don't really go well together. And we, we all implicitly know this. So um, this, is, this is what I'm about to now talk about, is well, what can we do, what can we give developers um, from a deployment perspective, because that's kind of what I care about, um, where it's easier for you to do the right thing than not to. Um, choosing JRuby turns out to be a little bit hard for some reason. I don't know. You should just use it. Grow up. Um, and, uh, but I understand, and I'll talk about the distinction of why MRI, why people do one versus the other. Um, but this is what I want to talk about. I'm going to do a demo of a, of a piece of software that I think is really interesting when you get to scale. Uh, I'd certainly like to see Engineer have a product that's similar to it. And that's what we're working on. Um, and so there's the, uh, there's this idea that the tools that you've chosen, I use tools to represent everything, libraries, languages, tools, um, and they were all built to solve a problem, but they come with consequences. And if you get too much in love with the, the good part, you perhaps ignore or, or dismiss, sort of in a DHH-esque fashion, the consequences. That wasn't a joke, he does that all the time. Um, Exists really good at it, and you go, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. We should all own a car that drives 300 kilometers an hour, traffic it a lot faster. He's never said that, but I've thought it. And anyway, <laughs> that was just stupid. So, yeah. So as I just said, every tool has some purpose for why it was written, and we're going to go through some examples. And uh, they come with a thought model that they're sort of imposing on you or hoping you adopt it in order to make the tool make sense. Um, and uh, but in, in in adopting the tool it makes something else harder. Um, for example, I thought, no, no, I'll come to that example, it's in a second. So here's an example. I like people to traffic, I think it's fantastic. It looks very pretty. Um, it, you know, this idea of, well, look, you know, you've got that, that, that stakeholder, that, that owner, that says, yes, we should do X, comes back three days later, let's do Y. And you say, they're letters of the alphabet, that's stupid. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, and, and so the solution to some degree is, to, well, let's write them all down, Let's put them in an ordered list, and let's just see where X and Y turn up, and whether they're going to fit into the budget. This is, I think, you know, uh, Agile in general, I think, is fantastic. Um, getting your system into production and finding what errors turn up and fixing them is just the right thing. Uh, but what's interesting of this tool is there's not really a way of, of talking about constant things that should do, constant things that shouldn't do, like crash, and another thing of list that I've apparently not put on the slide. I mean, who's doing fucking checking my slides? You can't just have a list that has one item and a comma. Um, <laughs> I've got to ad lib this. Uh, crap, <laughs> now I've got that stupid thing that I can't remember the rest of the list. Let me get my notebook out. No, anyway, uh, you know, it shouldn't crash. It shouldn't destroy small planets. It shouldn't, um, it shouldn't make your you know, customers cry and hate you and talk about you negatively. There's a lot of things, but it's just, as a tool, it's hard to sort of mention that and, and allocate time to doing these things. So why do we not do some of the things that we're going to talk about and use the tools? Because perhaps some of the tools don't infer that we should spend time that way. Um, so you may need to take the tool, subvert it slightly, and put in every week. Spend time as chores. Let's do some log looking. You know, let's look at some logs. Let's see what we find. Let's go back through all our exceptions, all four million of them in you know, Airbrake. Let's pick out a good one and fix it. Um, Chef. Chef was built for a purpose. It was built by a group of people who had got sick and tired of provisioning, you know, static service. And how quickly and redoing them, those servers were there. Um, 
ultimately cloud came along and it became useful then, but it couldn't provision anything. Um, but it turns out, for all the greatness of Chef, that it's still, it's, you, know, you still need to know how to configure MySQL. And that's shit. So what does Chef do? It just hid that for a bit. Uh, so, um, and, uh, so wh what am I saying? I'm saying that Chef is great, but it comes with, the con you know, there's, it hides things, there's still things you still need to do. Um, uh, what's another one? Ruby, uh, specifically MRI, because I do want to make a comment, Jay Ruby, uh, <laughs> may never quite get off that bandwagon. So Ruby was a fantastic language, right? That's what we're all here. And uh, I'm not going to play that game where I put, ask you to put your hand up because you're terrible at it. Um, <laughs> got, you've lost hand putting up privileges. <laughs> Stop it, right? <laughs> Bloody poms. Um, and uh, so, what was my point? My point is, I mean, Ruby was written and with a, with a, a thought model of we should be happy as we go about our profession, a as we write our code. And then someone came up with syntax highlighting and the world was complete. Um, but it's not really, it was never really designed or had the thought process around long-running production systems. I mean, it can't. And no disrespect at all. I mean, it was, that's, you know. Um, and so, uh, but there's also other things that are part of the, the community that we have, the ecosystem, the thought processes we all bring to code and we all agree on. Code should be pretty. And I'll tell you what's ugly, handling errors. So let's not do that. Let's let those bad boys go straight up to the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> I get very excited about that. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, uh, I think Matt Amanini mentioned it. I mean, I really only thought about this when I saw Blake Mazzari do a talk on Go, and so compared, or there's sort of things from Go that you could bring to Ruby. And one of the ideas in Go as a language is dealing with errors immediately. And uh, when you start to think about that, it's exactly what you should do. As you accumulate, as you start to realize, you know exactly why this error is here. When you start throwing it up to the stack, it doesn't know why the exception, what the relevance is, what it should do about that, how to handle it. It's com completely subverted the context and, and said, you know, this piece of code now, you now need to know about what that was doing. And that's not very nice encapsulation. So dealing with errors locally helps manage error rates. And unfortunately, it's going to make your code ugly. So this, I guess, is my prime example of the idea that as you care about production, as you want to keep improving your success rates and reducing error rates, you're going to need to do some things that perhaps are not very Ruby-ish, like handle errors. So every day, put another if statement in. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm becoming a, a, a not a fan of exceptions in general. Unfortunately, all the libraries are, use exceptions as a form of declaring that something went bad. Um, Go, I, I kind of like that idea of another you know, uh, Objective-C. You, you can, all right, I mean, it's, uh, so yes, I should finish that thought and then go back to just the, the idea of exceptions I don't like. So yes, so the idea, as he just said, is to put your rescue blocks explicitly in that context. Um, there's just still something about exceptions that uh, I'd rather they came through the standard medium of a method, which was uh, either the, the read-write parameters or the uh, response. So the idea of returning a real value and perhaps an error value, if necessary. I, I just think that, is um, it makes, how do I put it? Uh, actually, the way Blake mentioned it was he said, the word exceptional, or the word exception, makes it sound like exceptions are exceptional. They never happen. They happen all the time, all right? <laughs> when you do distributed programming, you know, the boxes talking to each other, uh, the moment you add that second box, congratulations, you've got distributed programming, um, like a database. And uh, it's not always there. But that's not exceptional. You know it's not gonna be there sometimes. You know it. Sometimes it will be out. And you know that because you put your app on Amazon US East. <laughs> so, it's just not all have, oh, it's Amazon's fault. No, it's your fault. Listen for that error, which will happen again, uh, even if you move somewhere else, um, and, uh, and make your app behave in an appropriate fashion. Don't bitch. I mean, yes, you want to fix it and get back up and running, but I mean, you can't stop physical hardware having problems, but your code can handle it. Um, all right, so that's uh, <laughs> really, <laughs> I really rabbit on about that one for a long time. Um, so from the Ruby on Rails website, it says web development that doesn't hurt. No mention about production. 
Um, so I think I've covered this topic for a while, but um, no, actually I haven't. Let's do it again. So uh, I heard a good tip for, for dealing with DBs. As your, DB, as your SQL database scales, you're going to think about sharding. And one of the things that makes sharding hard is when you do long joins between tables. So don't. Be, you know, be conscious of, of, of the join as you start to get you know, more production orientated, start to scope down and think about your app in such a way that you don't have joins across seven tables because you're not going to be able to shard that. Um, but Rails, with its beautiful uh, active record um, syntax, makes it really easy and fun. You want to join everything. It's like you want to get back in a circle. Hey, I'm back to the user model again. I win a prize. <laughs> um, not very good for production. So. Um, uh, Platform as a service, uh, you, we, you know, we make deployment really easy. Let you describe all your universe, things that I like a lot. Uh, but not really a lot of assistance in the context of apps talking to each other. This idea of perhaps a platform as a service should make this easier to deal with failure of in a, in a, you know, systems that talk to each other. Um, so, uh, you know, just because you should still use Engine Yard. No one else fixes this problem either. So just use Engine Yard. You just keep assigned languaging to the one person. I at least want that person being a customer by the end. All right. Um, all right. All right. So let's get back to production. So there's, that was sort of my summary of tools in general uh, and thought process, just to sort of get you to think about this idea. Um, I do want to talk about deployment specifically. I just do want to scale it down to this one topic. Um, so. I, don't, I mentioned before, I don't know how to prove or suggest or infer that if your production system's happy, you'll be happier. Um, so we'll skip it and just go with it. Um, so here's a couple of things that you might like to choose, which are going to affect your development life a little bit, but at the benefit of having a better production life. Uh, JRuby, being on the JVM, has a whole bunch of really cool tools, inspecting, uh, getting snapshots of what was going on at the time that's blocked up or whatever. Um, obviously, the threading. Well, I don't want to talk about threading. So that's not going to make you buy anything. I found that out last year. Don't do threading. Don't. Don't. I dare you. I dare you not to. Don't. There, yeah, I win. Ha -ha. It's like telling a dog that's already lying down. Lie. Stay. Ah, I'm an excellent owner. Um, so, uh, but the cost of using JRuby, one of them, is that, you know, all that sort of just day-to-day -day usage of Ruby, the, the scripting usage, it gets slower. And that's a little bit annoying. And uh, so this is sort of that main example, that idea that something that's good for production, you as developers, or let me put this another way, all the people around you, because you've changed your mind already, um, you know, choosing perhaps an inferior production choice, perhaps, um, because you'd rather have the one that's good for you as a developer. You want the zippy fast one for when you're on your rate task, but it may not be the good one for in production. Um, so uh, the other reason, I mean, this is an example. If you've never seen a, a screenshot of Visual VM, a whole bunch of interesting uh, introspection of what's going on. So as you put that chore on your weekly list of things, how are we going to make our system better, throwing up Visual VM and, and watching for, for interesting data is, uh, is one thing. Um, a bunch of other cool tools. Um, so queues, using queues rather than so sort of blocking HTTP. Block, look, HTTP APIs are awesome. I mean, you can use curl and play with it. I love it. Um, but blocking, not good, uh, especially with your non-concurrent uh, apps that you're all writing. So, <laughs> so perhaps uh, investigate an asynchronous queuing. Um, what else? Uh, logging. There's an excellent, especially if you're going to have uh, multiple systems, which you already have because you have an app talking to a database. Pulling all those logs together. Initially, it will just be ugly. And you'll go, well, what was the point of that? Well, then go back to the app and start to curate interesting, useful logs that tell you a story. So perhaps you can search for a user and watch what that user was doing throughout the system. Um, people, uh, so out of all the sort of app service companies that have come out recently, I, wait, sorry, I'll start that again. Splunk is worth a truckload of money. Splunk is, uh, anyone heard of Splunk? Um, cool. I, did that judge? I did they actually ask that question. You're terrible at this. Uh, put your hand up at the wrong time. Don't put it up at the right time. Um, spiteful. That's what you are. And so I was at Java One and, and did a quick talk on Logstash and uh, asked that same question. And uh, no one had heard of Splunk. So I, told, I, I just told a joke to them. 
and I'm going to tell that same joke, but I have to set it up. And you answered incorrectly. Uh, <laughs> but the joke was the reason that you couldn't, uh, you don't know about it is because you can't afford it. Um, Splunk is really, really expensive. And, uh, but uh, Logstash and Kibana are uh, open source and, uh, um, and, and really quite interesting for you to look at. But there's also Paper Trail, Logly, and, and use them. Start putting logs in there. Start to get a feel for the flow of your system. You know, you don't really have, perhaps in your mind, a good ment a mental picture of what, how your app behaves in production, really. And logging is, is one, and it, watching all the events is one way to do that. Uh, the trick is, obviously, you have to spend time looking at them. Um, Bosch. So Bosch is something I li I've liked, and Bosch solves this interesting problem of, of, of deploying entire systems and knowing what's happening, as opposed to, you know, perhaps the chef mentality of, well, a node came up and it became something hopefully good. Um, Bosch has this more declarative, you, I like the sort of totalitarian master of the universe, I will tell all the VMs what they are, and they shall be happy for it. Um, and I, I, I've started to really appreciate the value, the mental, the mental thought that's gone into Bosch. Um, and uh, for the lack of there being a commercial tool that I, my company has produced, I will keep talking about this uh, until we have one, and then <laughs> I'll have to stop. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to do a demo of Bosch, because I, th I think it's the thing I would like you to think about as you get bigger as a company, this idea of being absolutely declarative, not having, ex reducing the number of external dependencies of your production system, things that could go wrong. Because as we talked about, we need to continually reduce those. So Bosch may not be for you today. If you're running a couple of dynos on Heroku, if you've got a couple of VMs with Engine Yard, you're good, right? But as you get bigger and you want, you know, you've got more and more requests, you're gonna, this is one of the things perhaps to think about. Um, so uh, let's, let's have a look. So well, the example app is GitLab HQ. Um, which is uh, I chose because it's kind of a Rails app. It's got a few moving parts. In fact, here's my, uh, my, my architectural diagram. It's a Rails app, right? We then also got Git, uh, Git, Git Lite, which is, uh, does the, sort of the Git stuff. Um, and so we're going to deploy this as a sort of a complex system. And it's, it's going to be awesome. Look, I even found a, an icon that makes you want to click it. But stay seated, everyone. Don't fall for the trap of the large touchscreen monitor. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, this, this, I'm not even going to pretend to type for 10 minutes. Look, no hands. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, deploy this. So I have already written a description of how you deploy GitLab HQ, and uh, it's going to Bosch release. Now we can look at it. For anyone that's interested, if we have time, we can look at it. But um, um, it has the source code to GitLab HQ, the source to Gitalite uh, submoduled, all the other dependencies you'll see are now being downloaded. Now, they're not being downloaded from some magical other place. I've already downloaded them once from the magical other place, and they're on my S3 account, because we're trying to reduce external things that could go wrong. Um, and, uh, and once I pull them all down and we create a Bosch release and put it into my Bosch, that's it. That's the last time we go out to the rest of the world for the rest of that app's life, um, unless we want more dependencies like, you know, a new version of Ruby or something. I haven't touched this for a while. <sighs> a new version of Postgres. Anyway, let's move on. Stop looking at version numbers. I feel like I want to type something, but... <laughs> so fake, I should pretend. <laughs> oh, fuck! No, anyway. Um, you can make screencasts that go wrong really fast and don't have the inconvenient and awkward pauses, but then you don't learn anything. So we'll have the inconvenient, awkward pauses. Um, so what it's doing now, it's downloaded all the assets that I need, because we're not going to use app get or you know, those packages because they're external. They're, you could build this system using that concept of, of you just have your own uh, you know, app get repo. Uh, and so, but Bosch sort of does it all itself. So uh, now what we're going to do is, I can't remember, we are going to, is that me? Sweet. I'll be back. <laughs> God, Jesus Christ. Um, okay, so what we've done, the, the context here is we're actually on, um, not my machine, but just a, a VM. A um, lot faster if you do it in the cloud. And uh, so we've pulled all these things down from S3. We've turned them into a sort of a big tarball. 
And now what we're doing is we're uploading it to Bosch. Bosch is not a, uh, like a command line, just a pure command line. It's a running service, a bit like a PaaS might be. And uh, so what we're doing is we're uploading it, and now Bosch has the big tube of T-shirts. What? Stop it. <laughs> Distracting me. Um, so I'm packing those things. Now this time, what we have is, so it now knows about a release called GitLab HQ, uh, it, and I've, it's there, 7.1.5, I mean, 7, sorry, 7.1 7 dev. Um, so now what we need to be able to do is deploy it. So there's sort of these two main concepts, a release and a deployment manifest. A deployment manifest is, that is awkward, all right? <laughs> I keep thinking it's something that's awkward and you're hearing it from me. Uh, <laughs> So a deployment manifest is a big YAML file, which is great because it's text and you can read it. Awkward because, you know, I really would rather have that. Uh, <laughs> as much as I love YAML, sometimes I wish there was a schema I could validate it against. Um, <laughs> and, you know, probably should, <laughs> shouldn't say that out loud. Um, but, but I want XML back. So uh, if we go, uh, sorry, I really talked through that. So what we're doing now, jobs, uh, the different moving parts or sort of, for the most part, you can think of them as one VM's worth of work. Uh, you can merge them into the same VM, but that's kind of the context. And so you can sort of see them as those boxes I had, Git Lite, Redis, GitLab, and Rescue, which isn't, you know, sorry, Mike, I, I, I can't believe I've moved to Sidekick. I, I'm insulted on your behalf. And, um, and then the last part, which we skipped over, is all the sort of the, the parameters, the arguments that are gonna go into all the temp templates. So they're all in one place, like a data bag if you're uh, doing Chef. And I'm not really a Puppet person, so um, if you want to sort of tell me about Puppet relative to this, uh, that'd be great. So now we've just told the command line tool, this is the deployment manifest of what I care about. And the way Bosch does deployment is it sort of says, well, what have you already got? What do you want? And I'll go get that for you. The first time, you've got nothing. So it looks like it does everything. Well, it does, right? So first thing it's going to do is compile stuff. This, I think this is fantastic. Uh, it comes built in with its own packaging, binary packaging thing against whatever the base operating system that you have got. So in this case, it's some version of Ubuntu, but it's your version of Ubuntu. So you, there's no chance of packages having been built on a slightly different uh, environment being applied to yours. They're going to be built in exactly the same environment. Um, so as they're compiling here, this is my uh, Amazon account. You can see there's four VMs available for compilation. Um, it finished and we moved on. <laughs> that was terrible. Um, oh no, so what we're doing now is while it's running, because one of the packages was a Perl, and whoever built Perl had a lot of mm, spare time. So it takes like 30 something minutes to build on an M1 medium. Um, so this is a bit of uh, Bosch's tooling. You can see what you know, processes are running. Uh, you can go on from another machine, you can go and watch that process just as, as if you were doing it when you did it yourself. So teams can watch a deployment. Um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, nearly every action is, is sort of uh, a rescue job, so to speak, and you can watch it. Um, and also all, all the log information for that is kept and you can go and get it. So there's lots of different ways to look at tasks. Let's just take a moment to appreciate that I didn't make you watch Perl being compiled for 30 minutes. Are you getting why I did a screencast? Yeah, because this stuff takes forever. Um, one of the things we have to give up. So this is sort of just another way of looking at that data. So this is raw data that you could perhaps build a, a nicer interface on top of, should you wish to. Certainly one of the things I've been working on for my own amusement. All right, so now we've finished compiling packages. Now we're going to boot up some VMs. Why are we booting VMs? Because that's where stuff runs. And that's what we put in the, the deployment manifest. If we go back to it, you'd get to see that there we had five VMs, one for each of the different uh, jobs, Bosch jobs. And uh, so now we're booting them up. God, this takes forever, even when you cut it all out and make it faster. I'm so impatient. And there's really no funny jokes to tell about VMs booting. Your patience is, I can get the cannon, get the cannon. Squad of three and a decoy squad, go. Uh, so uh, it takes a little while, but eventually, you know, GitLab is running. And so I think this is really interesting. I was able to deploy, yeah, I mean, it's, the manifest is a bit icky, but at least, you know, it's an interface. 
You could build a tool that made it easy to work with the YAML manifest. This is the VMs running. Um, you can see on the right, four of them have Elastic IPs assigned to them. Uh, that does, Bosch now does have uh, an internal DNS, so I didn't really need all those Elastic IPs anymore, but I haven't figured out how to make that work yet. Um, and, oh, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to change it, the deployment. In this case, it's, uh, there's a deploy in Bosch language, and certainly why I think about it, is it could be changing scale attributes, bigger VMs, more VMs, it could be changing uh, configuration, um, or it could be changing the release. So we may have cut out a new release of some software, which might be a new version of Postgres, might be a new version of your web app, new version of one of the things that's part of your system. Bosch doesn't think of your Ruby code as all that special, uh, just, just to get the gist of it. Uh, your Ruby code is just a thing that runs. So uh, here we're gonna add an extra rescue thing. We got, we've, you know, somehow the rescue workers weren't very <laughs> Uh, productive, and so <laughs> the solution for rescue is to just add more resources. Uh, or use Sidekick, and I'm sorry, Mike, for not putting a Sidekick slide in there. Please, in your mind, put in a Sidekick slide. Move to Sidekick, it's good. Um, so you can see it's sort of a prompted, this is the delta, do you want me to do this? Yeah, good, and off it goes, adding a new VM, turning it into rescue, and uh, Bob's your uncle. It does take a lot longer than this. Now we get to see the extra VM. Look, perhaps this doesn't impress you, but if you've ever had to manage your own VMs, this is awesome. Um, the other tool it has is built-in SSH. So it will go off to that VM, create a random username account for the purpose of that one session. Uh, you give it the, a, a password for this session, for sudo, so that you can change it each time if you want. It doesn't do auditing, which is a nice sort of you know, what did that person do whilst on the VM? That'd be a nice feature, it doesn't have that yet. Uh, so you can see that random uh, username. And what we're gonna do is just look at the process list, just to see why, you know, we still haven't quite got enough rescue workers. Oh look, there's only one of them. So whichever genius wrote this, and me, um, didn't put in enough rescue workers. So now let's look at some, some, some a little bit of how this works. It's all on my GitHub repo if you wanna go and play with it and have a look around. Um, so this, instead of chef, it's sort of, it's shell script. Shell's actually kind of good when you, you know, get over it. So um, here I'm running rake, and you can see I've only got one of them. Oh, and look, there's a fix me to add more workers. So anyway, um, <laughs> I'm a genius. And that's, that's that, right? I, I find this, the ability to describe everything exactly is just removes all the possible things that go wrong. It, it makes, it makes understanding the system simpler. And, and the less things I have to think about, the, the, the less the chance I'm gonna make a mistake somewhere. Um, there may be other things that are similar, and again, you, you know, it's hard to play with everything. Uh, and if you have a tool or a set of tool chain that fits into a similar model, I'd love to talk to you about it because well, I think this stuff is fascinating. Uh, I mentioned this before, but your Ruby app really is, is, is just another process. It's not special when it comes to ops. Um, it's special in that it balks all the time or bloats or does all sorts of other aberrant behavior, but uh, beyond that, um, so the way this sort of works is, you know, it's just processes and we're running on VMs. Uh, a Bosch release is fundamentally two things. A set of job descriptions, which as you saw is sort of, it's, it's shell scripts, because they're kind of easy to write, and templates. So Chef, as an example, uh, you programmatically say whether you want a template or not. You programmatically say whether you want a package or not. You programmatically say what, you know, what to do next. Chef, uh, with Bosch, no, 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 none of that. You just, in a YAML file, say what packages you want, and they'll be there. You render all the templates, and why not? And uh, then you use shell scripts to generate everything else through start, stop, and monitor. Packages, as we sort of talked about, you go and get all the, the source code for yourself. You do your own uh, installation scripts. They're all easy to do, and once you've done them, you never do them again. So that compilation step never happens again. So we deserve these nice things. And you can read this slide later. I do want, for as much as I like Bosch, they're a bit not you know, perfect by any means. Uh, and uh, why, what's the highlight there? You know, getting started, how do you, gotta, you gotta run your own Bosch. So if you're, you know, don't have a big budget for running Amazon VMs, or don't have a you know, vSphere account or whatever, uh, you know, it sounds expensive. So it's not for everyone. 
can't run on bare metal at the moment because it wants to manage VMs and attach disks and all that sort of cool stuff. Um, and it's a sort of single region, so if you want multi-region, you have to have separate washes. But it is an idea. If you've described everything absolutely and have no external dependencies, theoretically, you might be able to answer this question with a different answer. So when that fancy enterprise person says, well, this looks fantastic, can I run into my data center? With this kind of tool, the idea here, perhaps you could say yes, even if it's completely locked off from you. And I think that's, that's an interesting idea of the future of, of deployment. People, I've talked to people and they say, no, I'd never want to sell to enterprise. I, you know, it's hard enough running this one thing. Well, what if it wasn't hard to run your one thing? What if deployment and management production systems made it as, as easy to run a thousand copies as it was to run one? Um, so the summary of my talk really is this math. Is, is as you add more traffic, you need to constantly be improving your error rates or your success rates. Um, and the, you are going to need to you know, change some of your behavior as, as you go along. Um, and you, uh, I don't want to say you're going to have to grow up, except can't think of another way of putting it. Um, so what I think the job of ops people in general, or the, or the, sort of the people who care about production systems, is to be constantly giving tools to, to, to us developers, the engineers, that help us do the right thing. That Bosch deploy, anyone could do that. Once the packaging's done, I mean, I could figure it out. And I'm not very bright. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Now, the last thing is uh, we are hiring because um, we still have money left. And <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I mean, we, this is, we, whilst we're not doing Bosch, we are doing something very similar. And it's, uh, it's really exciting stuff. Uh, if this sort of stuff tickles your fancy and you'd like to create the sort of new frontier of tooling for, for production systems, please uh, make sure you come and work for us. We'd love to have you. Uh, we've got the party on tonight. Here are some snapshots of people you should look for and talk to us about how much alcohol is awesome and whether we'd like you to come and work for us, vice versa. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>